So welcome to The Main Cut. I am your host, Jade, and today I'm here with six-time Emmy-nominated stylist, Derek Monroe. Uh, besides being the hairstylist behind the talk show The View um, and the movie Till, Derek has worked with a range of amazing celebrities from the likes of Angela Bassett to Whoopi Goldberg, Iman, Tyra Banks, Erica Badu, the list could go on and on and on. <laughs> But today we'll be talking to Derek about his journey into the industry, how he got to where he is today, um, and just, you know, nuggets of gold that can be shared with other people who are trying to pursue this path as well. So Derek, welcome to the show. We really appreciate having some of your time. No, thank you for having me. I'm super excited. No, so are we, but let's start <laughs> with the very beginning. So tell us a bit about your journey into the hair industry. Where did it all start? How did you get to, to being on The View? Oh my goodness. What, you just asked a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm supposed to simplify that. Okay, let's see how I do that. Okay. Um, okay, so I always had a love for hair. I think I always just did. Um as, as a young kid, I used to play with mannequins um, when I was like 13, 14. I used to feel like Sally's Beauty Supply was my Toys R Us. Just the amazing of going in there and uh, the products and everything. I don't know. I just all and I, I was one of those people that believe every product did what it said. So if it said it gives you curls, I was like, put it on the head. Let's see if it's giving me these curls. I'm like, it didn't give me these. Girl, <laughs> it grows your hair. I'll put it on like, oh, it did grow my hair. But it didn't matter. I was just so fascinated. Um, my mom passed away when I was uh, uh, 11 years old. So when she passed away, I lived in a small town. My mom was a single mother. And the only thing that was there job-wise was factory jobs. And there weren't really anything that, like, you could progress in. I mean, the job factory jobs were great, but I was seeing how the Plants were closing and, and jobs were moving. So I never wanted to be stuck in that rut. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was living off a Social Security check. Social Security cuts you off at 18. So I know at 14 and 15, I have to have a plan for what my life is when I graduate. And because of that, I was already doing people's hair on Saturday mornings. And I was like, wow. This was something that I was doing as a hobby that I really enjoy. So I feel like maybe I should try to pursue this. My high school was offering it as an elective. So I took it in high school so that when I graduated, I would already have my license because I knew I was not college material. I hated math. I just hated that the learning structure of, of school. So um, I took cosmetology in high school. Uh, the week before graduation, I took my state boards. When I graduated, I went to the beach. And while I was at the beach, my brother called me and told me my license that came in the mail. Prior to that, J.C. Penney's styling salon had came and <clears throat> did like a recruitment thing. I had went there. So I already had applied for a job at J.C. Penney in their styling salon. For when I graduated, the lady said, once you get your license, let me know. While I was there, I call, while I was at the beach and my brother had called me, I called her. I said, listen, I got my license. She said, I'll see you next week. And so I literally <laughs> went straight into a career directly after high school. So that's how I started in the hair business. Um, I then like worked in different salons, opened a salon of my own. I had a friend that was moving to, um, she, was, she was in law school, she was moving to Los Angeles, and she invited me to go, and I just felt like where God was moving me in my life, that that's where I needed to go as well. Like, I already felt like I needed to move, and it felt like when she offered that, that felt mm -hmm. like the answer to the prayer. So I went with her, and that pretty much opened up my whole uh, celebrity world. You know, because if I was going to move to L.A., I needed to work in a way that I didn't work um, here in Virginia. So I wanted it to be different. So I searched. That was before pre-internet. So here I am going through high hair magazines, all that stuff. And I'm looking at Devil Fox and who did her hair. And then I would find, like, what salon they worked in. So I'm sitting here searching to figure out how. So And it would have, like, Charlena Allen worked at 50 North Salon in Beverly Hills. Like, that's who did her hair. So I would find these salons, and then I would literally um, call and ask if they had openings for assistance. 
And literally, that's, you know, I moved to LA, so I get there. And I just started assisting different people. I was working with this one guy who was a horrible situation. Um, and then I found this lady named Shalina Allen. Shalina Allen was the lady that took Brandy out of her braids. So when Brandy first came on the scene with her hair loose, no braids, she was the one. Uh, she also worked with Eve, Kelly Rowland. And so I worked in her salon for about eight months. But in that time, that's how I met Brandy. And I was able to work with her when she couldn't do her. And then, you know, I started to, I went on the, her first video. All of this stuff was so new to me. And um, mm. it was my gateway into the industry, basically. So I don't know where, and then you said the view, so I did that as a huge job. <laughs> <laughs> There's a huge job because, okay, so then I do that. Um, and then I decide I'm going into ministry. Um, and my be- I know it's a so random. So my best friend was a pastor. And prior to me moving to L.A., I am like, you know, he had said he was going to start a church. And I was like, I feel like I should be a part of that as well. So L.A. is just going to be like a life experience thing for me where I'm just going here so that I can also experience people of different faiths and stuff because I was in this small Bible Belt situation where everybody thought the same, so it's easy to speak to them. I wanted to know how it was to speak to people that didn't grow up how I grew up, didn't know, think like I thought. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went there. And so I moved back to Virginia. I reopened my salon. And so now I'm a big fish in a little pond because, you know, I at that time, that's when people started working with the Indian hair extensions. So the hair that was going from curly to straight, that was huge because nobody really was able to do that, the way the hair flowed, the way the hair flat ironed, um, just even the method of the way people in L.A. did sew-ins. Um, and then in L.A., because they have no humidity, nobody was getting relaxers. So I was learning how to press hair. I was learning all these things that made me huge on the East Coast because – no one was doing hair like that. So my salon was very profitable. And from the people that I worked with in L.A., when they had opportunities, they would bring me along. So my friends started to work with Jada and Will. And so I was part, I was helping her with the with my hair back and forth video. So it was keeping me in small town, big fish. But I also was still having these opportunities to work in the industry and still be a part. So I was still up to date. Um, so she, my friend Marcia Hamilton, she was the one that was doing the hair. And then she would come and do fashion shows here in New York. And she was like, I'm putting myself on this assistant list with this mm-hmm. uh, agency called Art and Commerce. So I put my name on the list to be part of it. Now, they never called me. They never called me. They would always call her. They would never call me. All of a sudden, I started getting these emails from them asking them me to assist this guy named Teddy Charles. I don't know if you're familiar with Teddy Charles, but Teddy Charles is like this white hairstylist that did a lot of, uh, he does a lot of like major ad campaigns. He would do uh, Banana Republic, Michael Kors, all those things. So um, they would ask me to be a part of it, to assist them. I don't think they knew I lived in Virginia. But I never told them because I didn't want them to not call me because they literally would send me stuff like, are you available tomorrow? And so um, I would like, and where I lived in Virginia was eight hours away. So I would literally try. I would like have my assistant tell all my people I'm not coming to work tomorrow. She would reschedule them. I would do that day in the salon and drive eight hours overnight to be on whatever set. Um, and so that's how I started getting that access to New York. And then I had another friend that I had met in LA. She was working at the, she was working with Essence Magazine. Essence Magazine was doing one of the Wendy Williams fashion shows. And as a result of that, she invited me to come up for the fashion show. Well, I ended up doing the editor, the beauty editor for Essence because she was facilitating the fashion show. I ended up doing her hair. She loved me. Her name was Pamela uh, Edwards. I started doing her hair. So she would like request me. And she would always tell me, Derek, move to New York. I think you do well in New York. And I was like, no, because my time in LA was such a traumatizing time. It, okay. you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speeding through it, but it was a, it was a 
horrendous experience. And it made me say I never wanted to, like, move anywhere like that again. Right. <laughs> and so, um, so anyway, so I was doing the Wendy show. So anyway, well, actually, I was just there. And so while I was there, the young lady, that it was another young lady that I had met in L.A. All these L.A. connections. She she had moved to L.A. the same day I did. I met her as a shampoo. I was a shampoo boy shampooing her hair. She had now moved back to New York and was a producer on The Wendy Show. So she knew I was a hairstylist. So this is the, this is Wendy's first, like, season, second season. And so... They don't have a flow. So that what's happening here is their hair makeup person does both. He was the hair and the makeup person. His name was D'Angelo. Oh. And D'Angelo had gotten behind because they were doing fashion show segments. So they needed somebody to sort of help him with the hair. So she covered me. She was like, Derek, we're running a little behind. I know you do hair. Will you do hair? So I was like, sure. So I literally am just there to chill out for their fashion segment. But I end up helping out. And the guy was like, you did such a good job. Give me your information. We'll use you from that. So I started doing the Wendy show right. as their, like, helper for when they needed extra people. So now that's the Wendy show. So now I'm building up that little TV aspect. And I do a sh- I feel like it's so much. <laughs> Are you following the law? Am I'm I following. Lost? I'm following. There's a okay, lot of it's a lot. It's a lot. I'll try. Because the way you worded it, you said, tell us how you got into the industry, then to the field. <laughs> <laughs> so wait a minute, let me give it a pause. Because I feel like, a, is there anything you want to ask in between? No, I have questions, but they're follow-ups. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right, here we go. So, so, let, let me, so I'm living in Virginia. I'm driving eight hours to do the Windy Show whenever they call me whenever this guy asked me to come. And so I do a show also now called Behind the Sense of Beauty, but I wanted it to do it back then in 2011. Um, and so I, as a result of it, I started following this guy named Johnny LaVoy, who was like this hairstylist for L'Oreal. And I wanted to work with him and on my little show because I saw him on E! News. So I started following him on Instagram one Sunday morning. I look on his, uh, Facebook, not Instagram, Facebook, and he puts up a post saying that he's looking for hairstylists to complete his team for Project Runway. So I send in a message, and I'm like, yo, I want to be a part of it. He's just like, you live in Virginia. They don't fly people up here. We're not housing people. So if you're not able to do it, we can't, like, we can't do it. And so I said, listen, don't worry about that. I just need the position. Had no idea how I was going to make it, but just doing it anyway. So anyway, <laughs> he sends me, he sends me the invite. And, um, I mean, he's, uh, so I end up getting part of it and he, he puts me on it. So now I'm doing project on it. So now that's putting me in the mix now. So I, and I was there, like the way it worked was is, as they got rid of contestants, they got rid of artists. So because I was the newest one that hadn't really did the show. I would get sent home first. So, but leading up to it, here I was. I was um, one of the the people that stood the longest. So after season after season, he just kept asking me to come back. And I was one of the last people in his term that basically, out of the people that he originally used, I was one of the last people. So by this time, I had became his second in command. Uh, wow. Assistant. So those two things are going on. So going back to the guy, Teddy Charles, I'm assisting him, and he decides he needs a full-time assistant. So he says, because he had a guy, but him and him were like at a little bit of odds for a second. So he was like, I would love for you to come and be my new assistant. So I'm sitting here like, oh, my God, am I getting ready to move to New York? I instantly <laughs> start crying because I, I feel like, oh, my God, I never wanted to move to New York, but I feel like this is an opportunity I have to take. Mm. So I closed my salon within a month. And I moved to New York to be his assistant. At the same time, that the Project Runway guy asked me to do, which was my last full season that I did, he asked me to be part of that season. So I'm asking Teddy, like, I'm moving up here, but is it possible that I do this? He's like, oh, sure, no problem. I can work with you. Because 
He didn't work every day in Project Runway. It wasn't every day. They were like, you know, we only did the runway shows. And so I was like, okay, cool. So I get up there and I start doing Project Runway. And what I'm noticing is Teddy's not really calling. Now, by this time, I've gotten my apartment, I'm settled in New York, I'm all of these things. And I realize I'm not getting any calls from Teddy. So I call and I reach out. Teddy disappears. I don't hear from Teddy. I think they did invite me on one job. And when I get to that job, he has this little Asian guy that's like running around and he's doing all the jobs and stuff. And I'm like, and I'm like, I asked this other guy, I'm like, who is that? And he was like, oh, that's his first assistant. I'm like, first assistant? That's supposed to be my job. He's giving my job to this other guy. So now I realize I'm there with no job. And Project Runway, once the season ends, I'm done. So now I'm in New York with no job. Um, so the first two years of my New York experience was very hard because I did not have uh, any, like, real situation going on. Mm -hmm. And so luckily I knew a lot of people that started to refer me. So this one guy was like, oh, like, if you just, one thing about New York is if you let people know where you are, people tend to help. Um, right. So people knew that I needed work, so people would refer me. This one guy referred me to Tasha Smith. And so I started working with Tasha Smith. That same makeup artist referred me to Tasha Smith, Iman, and Tyra. Wow. <laughs> so those were all people that I ended up started working with. Tasha Smith was my first celebrity that I worked with, like, continuously, like, was the one that, like, when she, even though she was L.A. based, whenever she came to New York, Derek, Tasha needs you. Tasha needs you. Yeah. So it was, it was that kind of situation. So I was building. Um, and then same with Iman. Like, he called me one day last minute. It was like, oh, somebody's supposed to do her hair. So I go and I do her hair. And then next thing I know, she was like, oh, can you do this photo shoot for me? So I was like, and for a magazine. So I'm just mind blown because I'm just like, that's crazy. Um so now I'm in New York and time is building, building, and, and I'm starting to make more waves. I started working with some people at Essence because of, you know, I knew the beauty editor and that stuff. And then I started doing their editor at large. Um, so that's how I ended up working with Erica Badu because they needed a hair person that could do the whole trip to Africa. And, and they knew me. So they wanted to make sure because I had to do all, I had to do the cover, I had to do their fashion, I had to do the beauty, mm -hmm. all the things where they hired different people for, because mm -hmm. we were doing it in Africa and they couldn't bring multiple people, I had to do the whole magazine. So oh. that was the great thing about that. So that was my chance to go to Tanzania, uh, Zanzibar, all, mm -hmm. Nairobi, all those places. And so it was, it was a wonderful experience. And because Erica was the cover girl, I had got the opportunity to work with her. And so now I'm finally in this place. And also I started working with June Ambrose, um, who I had met on like a set. And she had just gotten the show. It didn't get picked up, but we did all, we had filmed it completely. So that was work. So I was now finally getting in a space where I wasn't having to go back to Virginia to do my clients in the mm -hmm. salon to be able to live in New York. Cause that's what I basically was doing. And so, um, the guy from, 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 Project Runway, we had started doing Rosie Perez. Johnny, he also, Rosie Perez was his client. Mm -hmm. Rosie Perez gets a job at The View as a host. So he does a, um, a breast cancer segment. And in that breast cancer segment, he calls me and asks me to help him with the hair. So that's when I go and I meet all the hair and the makeup people at The View. And so I make a connection with this young lady named Karen DePeach, who was Whoopi's makeup artist, she was also Rosie's makeup artist. And so the thing about it is when Johnny was doing it, I was like, Johnny, now you get to work at the view. He was like, yo, they don't really make a lot of money like that. So I don't want the job full time. So, so this is probably too much. I'm telling, but anyway, um, so, so when I, so I go to, so I'm now, I'm having these situations where they're inviting me to come and work at for a little random times if they need, you know, Yancey, who was the hairstylist at the time, they would call me like if he couldn't be there or if they needed somebody. So, or like they had a Halloween show and they needed extra hands, they would call me. Okay. And so I did that. So one day I'm working with Dark and Lovely. Okay. So, cause uh, a barber friend of mine had also saw that I didn't have work 
And so he had introduced me to this guy named Jose Jefferson, who was over at L'Oreal, Dark and Lovely, which is how I met our, our common friend, Katanda. Um, <laughs> Katanda James. They were over, so that was also work for me as well. So they would use me to be on what they call their style squad. So I would come and I would do hair for the buyers from the different stores that to show off the products so that they can right. see how the product works. And so I was working with him this particular day, and I get a call from Karen Dupuy, she was the makeup artist at the view, and she asked me, would I be interested in uh, testing with Raven Simone? who was a host on the show at the time, would I be interested in coming in testing with her? And I'm like, sure. And so I literally go and I do Raven a sew-in. They literally give me two hours to do a sew-in on Raven. Oh, wow. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Luckily, Raven had shade sides. So all I really had to do was worry about braiding down this metal. But still, I had like two hours to do it. And so I do it, I brown brush it, I do it, and and what she was doing at the time was this thing called Colors of the Raven Bow. So each week, she would spin this wheel, and she would pick a hair color, and whatever that hair color was, that was what she was going to wear for that week. Oh, it was wow. such a random, it was such a random segment, but that's what she would do. So that color was red, and so she would do this big reveal. So she comes out with this scarf on and she takes the scarf off and she shakes her hair and it's this new red style and everybody's like, yes, we love it. Like literally, I posted on my Instagram and it's like, ching, 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 ching. And so they were like, can you come tomorrow? Can you come tomorrow? And literally, as a result of that, I just kept coming back every day and then finally they're like, look, do you want the job? Now, mm. I was a little apprehensive because I remember the guy saying they don't pay that much. And also, mm. because people, I wanted to specify this because I think people think in television that people just make huge money. But you got to realize every avenue, especially for like television and editorial, there are really some low paid gigs, especially editorial. Editorial is very hard to make money in. Um, so you might see them doing these beautiful magazine covers and all of that stuff. But best believe, most likely, the people only made $250 from that gig. Wow. <laughs> so... That's something I just like for people to know, like, it's a glamorous looking life, but it's not everything that people think that it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so, but anyway, they were kind, because I also started getting in this space where people were starting to hire me for day gigs, where I was getting paid a whole lot more. And I was like, look, I just need to know that if something else more pressing comes along, that I'm able to do it. And they said, no, we'll work with your schedule however you need to do it just as long as you come and work with us. And so that's how I started at The View. I missed the part with Wolfie because there were some times I had tested with Wolfie prior. <laughs> but what was funny is when I got to the show, I only came to work with Raven. It was like a month and a half before I even touched Wolfie. Now, mind you, I had did our hair twice prior, just ran. They had just called me and was like, can you do Wolfie's hair? I went, did our hair, and would hear nothing back, nothing. And then... So like a month and a half later, one day she comes to me and she says, hey, I have this event where you do my hair. And I'm like, sure. And it was in D.C. So we had to travel together. Right. And her and her business partner, and they were like, you know, we did a great job. We feel like we can work with you now. And, oh. <laughs> and from then, we had a relationship. So, oh. yeah, a lot of people think like instantly I got to the view and it was Whoopi. It wasn't Whoopi. It was more so Raven. And me and Raven had a great relationship because we were both creatives. And she she let me do whatever I wanted to do. So that's how I got to do it. Did I get all of that here? Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> no, honestly, that's so amazing to hear. And it feels like it was a roller coaster full of ups and downs. And, you know, yes. one of the things, like you said, a lot of people don't realize when they see all the glamour of people once they've got to that point where they're consistently working with celebrities, they're on editorials, they're on TV shows, they're on films, people don't actually recognize the challenges that are faced as yes. you're having to build that career. That happened over years, you know, that did, yes. that wasn't overnight. That was years of work that you put in from when you were in high school all the way up until now. Um, <laughs> so it would be great to hear more about some of the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them. Oh, well. 
again, a lot of the challenges were trying to stay relevant. Like I said, by living in Virginia, that that business schedule, because a lot of times I would do the job, okay, there's the eight-hour drive up, but then to get back in the salon on the Friday, I would leave. So if Wendy called on a Wednesday for a Thursday show, it's a two-shape, two-tape show. So let me not finish. I get there at like one or two o'clock in the morning. I have to be on set by seven. I do the show and then I have to get on the road and drive another eight hours so that I can make sure that I'm in the salon by eight o'clock the next morning and I'm there all day. So there is dedicating your time. Um, the transfer from being in the salon to, um, working freelance is not getting paid mm. oftentimes. Like, first of all, sometimes you're, when you're building, you're doing stuff for free because you just want to show yourself or you're doing it at a very low rate because people don't really know you. So they try to, you know, and they know that you don't know the business. So they're going to say, Hey, we'll pay you $200 to do it. And in your mind, you're thinking that's a great rate when literally somebody that is established is making $1,200 to do it, but they're charging you such a low rate because one, you don't know the business and you don't know your value. Mm -hmm. And two, they think you're so excited that it's a celebrity that you're willing to do it. So there was a lot of that learning curve. Um, mm -hmm. And then not only that, but waiting. Like the one thing is to the point that they had to make a law. And here in New York, they have what's called um, Freelancers and Free Act because it's a law where people literally were not trying to pay people. And I literally have to use, I mean, in the last six months, I've had to quote this law to people that have tried to get over on me. And I, and I say this for anybody that listens, check your, your, your state or wherever to see what kind of uh, legislation is in place because mm. what will happen is they'll, they'll reach out to you and say, Hey, you know, can you do the job? And what's funny about it is the communication prior to the job is yeah. It's like a lot. Like they are on it. They are they are mm -hmm. calling you to make sure you can. What time are you gonna be there? Make sure you have this. Uh, can you do this? Blah 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 blah. That's what they want to know. When you get there to do that job, everything's all good. Now when it's time to pay, so what happens is I've had people say, okay, like send over the invoice. Then they say, well we have to get you upboard and in the system. My thing is, did you not know that you needed to get me awarded in the system when I took the job? So you should have mm -hmm. sent me that prior yeah. lesson learned. So then after that, what happens is, like, let's say you send the invoice. They'll wait the 30 days. Let's say it's 30 days. But some people will try to say, oh, we have a 60 day or a 90 day. I've had people say 90 days. Um, and it was with a major network that I had did one of their clients for like a press day. And they hit me back with, oh, so just so you know, we do a 60-day payout. And I said, no, I don't accept a 60-day payout. I've done the job. Why do you think that you could sit here and make me wait 60 days for $500? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so I, I quoted them the freelancers and free, and I do, I do do reports. I will report them. Like, I want them to know that I'm just not a threat, but I want them to know then I'm going to be a thorn in your side because you're not going to treat people like this until you change your methods of what you do stuff. So those, those are some of the things. And then, you know, um, being valued as a black hairstylist, like that's, that's a real thing. Like what they'll pay for a white stylist in comparison to what they'll do for a black stylist. And on this journey, I've, I faced being overlooked for a white stylist doing a job for a black hair care company mm -hmm. where the white stylist had black assistants oh. doing the basis of the work. So you you have this this white stylist because he's well known. They hire him. He brings in these two black assistants. So all the grunt work that black people are so knowledgeable in, the braiding, the twisting, the, all of the stuff that we do so well, that he would have them do. And then he comes, bluffs, directs the hair the way he wants to, whatever, whatever. 
So you can imagine, and and a lot of times this would be huge. Um, a lot of times these would be huge campaigns. So these people are getting paid fifteen thousand dollars possibly, and imagine how much they're paying the assistant. Just imagine, and pennies. So if you're getting fifteen, or even if you're getting ten, and I tell you, hey, I'll give you a thousand dollars for the day. If you don't know no better, you know, or you know, if you're just you're like, wow, that's that's not bad, you know, that's a that's good money. But if you're comparing it to what they're getting paid, you're mm-hmm. getting cheated, you know, and you're doing the grunt of the work. And then probably they're also making sure that you're watching the hair on set because a lot of times with that there are multiple sets going on. So they might be shooting still pictures over here, videos over here. So I can't be in one place. So my assistant has to watch the hair on this. And while I'm over here, but I'm the one running the show. So it's, it's, it's been watching a lot of, you know, um, inequity or I, I hope you're not saying that right, but like it just being overlooked in ways. So yeah, um, those are some of the hardships. <laughs> just the, oh, just a few. I can imagine, but it's also really good for, for all of the people who are listening who are stylists who want to pursue this path because there are so many that do. There are so many stylists who want to run their own salon, who want to go on TV, who want to be in film, who want to do the runway. And it's one thing to want to do it, and it's another thing to know the realities of what will come or what's likely yes. to come. And yes. unless we have conversations like this where the people who've been there, done it, worn the t shirt, say these are the battle wounds, you can yeah. get there, but this is the reality then, you know, people never really know what they're signing up for. I agree, for sure. They never really know. Um, so, no, I appreciate you sharing all of that that with us. And, I mean, at the very beginning, I mentioned you have been nominated for six Emmys. Yes. That's a huge achievement, to even get to a point of being nominated, let alone nominated six times for the view. Yes. That's, you know, that's incredible. And you've been on the show for... for like you said, a long time. You've so almost been... nine years in March. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! Almost a decade. Almost a decade. Yes, that is crazy. You've served Raven, Whoopi, and many other people there. So, mm-hmm. what have you loved most about working on the show? Um, what I have loved most about working on the show is probably stuff that um, people probably don't. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a kid that was raised by television in a way. So I do love meeting my heroes. You know, a lot of people like to try to act so like, oh, I'm never starstruck and that, that, that. It's not so much that I'm starstruck, but there are people that are placeholders and a mile monumental to my life in ways of like, oh my God, when I was growing up, I was listening to New Edition. So to sit there and have a day where New Edition is on the show, it's like, oh my God, my childhood. You know what I'm saying? Um, but not only that, but because we are a political show as well, um, to be able to meet people like John Lewis before he passed, um, to be able to have met Kobe Bryant before he passed, um, to be able to have, I had to touch up uh, Kamala Harris. I've had to touch her up twice when she came to the show because you know, she's not, she wasn't a celebrity. She, people failed to realize she was a civic officer. So you have these people that they don't have hair and makeup. So most of the time, the political people, they use whoever's at the show. So there were two times that I was the designated person to be Kamala Harris's touch up person. Now I'm sure she has someone, because when she came last time, I didn't have to touch her up. But there are two, so there are these moments that you know, Katanji Brown, the, the sitting Supreme Court, those are people that I've had the opportunity to meet wow. in a way that I would never get a chance to meet these people ever in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and to have a moment to say thank you and I appreciate you and all these things. And even down to, it was a case in Florida where the uh, woman, um, her son was being picked on by this racist white woman wow. and she had I think taking the, the kid's uh, iPad and they went, the mother went to confront her at her door about giving back the iPad and cursing at the kids and she shot the woman through the door. To be able to 
have the opportunity to interact with her kids. When I tell you, I cried the whole day. Like, mm. I cried because I'm a child that knows what that loss is to not have your mother. Mm. And to see how well adjusted he was. And he was on the show because they were sending him to a grief camp. And what was interesting was he loved the temptations. Now, I'm trying to figure out how this 10-year-old knows anything about the temptations. <laughs> but he, they had given him his camp stuff, and they had put stickers of the temptation. Now, ironically, one of my best friends is a temptation. He does the uh, part of the one with the Melvin, I think it's Melvin Franklin, that has the deep voice. Mm. So he takes that part. So all the deep bass baritone stuff he does when he's friends with Otis and so I was able to connect them so that the little boy could go to the concert so there are these little moments that are always life changing to even be a part of the Sister Act 3 I mean Sister Act 2 reunion that Whoopi did and to see how much that moved her and how you know and to have like different world cast come all of those are moments that I just cherish to be a part of at the show so yeah those are the things that yeah I, i'm very appreciative of no that's in, that's incredible and also like you said it's almost like once in a lifetime you've been there for almost 10 years and you have all of these once in a lifetime interactions moments and, yeah and that's like so wonderful to hear and especially like i said for people who want to get into the business it's like mm -hmm. you can you can be in positions where this really is life-changing Mm -hmm. And you're able to just walk into those rooms with these people and interact with them and, like, you know, help them serve them. But then also yeah. become, when you're a stylist, you're also someone's ear, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's... Yeah, you, you really are. So that is something. If nothing else, just to be encouragement. Because sometimes, you know, before you're doing those major, you know, appearances and stuff, it's all about how you feel. And if someone, if you realize the energy you bring and spirit you're, you possess of like making sure that you would be that encouragement and that uplifting and make them have that little extra pep when they go out there, it makes a world of difference. Yeah. So I don't take my position in life uh, by any means uh, lightly. So yeah, mm. I'm very appreciative of that whole situation. I, I love that and I mean besides being on on the view you also have your own show you mentioned behind yes. the scenes beauty um what inspired you to start that what's funny is it's taking a turn what it started what inspired me was I wanted to sort of talk to hair makeup artists stylists I wanted to talk to people across the the, the styling uh the beauty range um, and just sort of hear, like, I want you to do, like, tips, how you could, you know, you know, all these little things and how they got into business and all that stuff. And then also just, uh, just show love to the people that I felt like had paved the way for me. Um, so that's how I sort of started. That was, like, the intention. Um, since then, though, what happened was uh, I started out with some hair and some makeup people. But what I found was it's harder to book hair and makeup people to be guests on the show than it is actual celebrities. All right. <laughs> and um, to also, I, I booked Raven because she was my first celebrity on the show. I booked her because I also wanted to hopefully, I felt like a celebrity would help boost it. Mm -hmm. So I had her come on the show. Um, and then it just started to become more of a conversation about people's journeys. And so now I think about it in the beauty behind the scenes because I think it's easy to see what we put out, but I love the journey is so much more important to me. Um, mm -hmm. And you just have an appreciation for what you see. You know what I'm saying? When you, when you see a person that has worked out, that has took the time to to work on their skin, that did their hair, and blah, 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 blah. Mm. That final image has a different appreciation than just if you just knew nothing about what went into making that or putting that forward, you know? So, yeah, the, yeah that's, that's, that's what inspired me to do the show. Okay. And 
you know, since you have been running it, what have been some of your favourite moments of, you know, leading that and building that from the ground up? Um, what has been my, you know what, I think I live in a world where I am so not, uh, aware of my <laughs> own, my own, uh, I don't know what the word is, my own experiences, because it's, you're working so much to build that it's very rare that you ever take the time. I, I did an interview with Ego Walden from Saturday Night Live. Um, and she was talking about, cause, you know, I'm sitting here like, wow, you had the opportunity to do this whole skit with Dion Warwick. And, you know, you had been imitating her. And so here she comes, she's on the show. Did you even, and she was like, the work is so fast and it moves so quickly that you never have the time to really take in what you've done because it's on to the next. And that's yeah. basically how I feel. Uh, you know, I do take the time to go back and I look through my Instagram and I think, wow, you interviewed Wendy Williams. One of the last coherent interviews she did prior, you know. So when I think about that, I'm like, that's that's pretty dope. Like, you are a person. And mind you, I don't have a huge following. Like, I'm not a person that like, oh, you know, I already have. 700,000, you know, subscribers. So it does mm. your purpose to actually come on my show. Everybody that's been a guest on my show has basically done it out of just being amazingly sweet and caring and just kind to me because of our relationship. So mm -hmm. from that, you know, of course, Whoopi, but like, you know, the Wendy Williams, the Tiffany Haddishes, Anthony Hamilton was a result of a great relationship with a friend that's a publicist that he made sure that he came on the show. Like oh, it's all of these amazing people that I look back and I think for you not to have 20,000 subscribers, Luke Nail, Sherry Shepard, Cameron Hall, all these people that are like, you know what? I rock with Derek just because of who he is, you know what I'm saying? Of who he is as a person, not because this makes me, you know, it's going to do so many numbers or I know that it's worth it, but, you know, just because he's a dope person. And, you know, uh, I, I've also appreciated a lot of the stuff has the questions and the conversations have been inspiration to me. And that's why I do it so that people that have goals and aspirations can see people's journey. Cause I think we always take for granted what it took to get there. Even just like what you're doing here from, from me, I think if I would have had any of this when I was coming along, it would have prepared me so much better. You know what I'm saying? Like, even me just talking about the, the money aspect of it. Like, if I had heard that prior, oh, I would have been so much more prepared for when I went through this stuff than, you know, just having to wing it. You know, I wish that with people. So um, that's been the beauty of it, of just letting people hear everybody's different ways of how they made it into their into their perspective fields, whether they were hair, makeup, or celebrity. Uh, or styling, so you know, it's it's oh, been nice. it's been a beautiful journey. I love that, uh, and it's also really wonderful to see just how much you want to give to the community, because you yeah. already you have so many things to do and so many people to serve, and you've chosen to create a show that serves the community as well, because you know that's an opportunity for so many other people to hear these stories, and like you say gain those nuggets that otherwise like until you're in it you just don't know yeah. so to you hear don't. it from people who have been there and done it is just such um it's a real blessing for people yeah. to have access to that information <laughs> yeah for sure i, I did avery w uh, wilson who's a, a singer he was also in the whiz um and i asked him like who was his role model like who helped him mm -hmm. and he was like he didn't really have anybody and so hopefully for those people that don't really have anybody, if nothing else, he can inadvertently be your mentor just by having heard his story, you know, and making you aware of the businesses you're getting into and the dreams you have. Because I think we, you know, we romanticize a lot of what it would be like without really thinking about the hard work that goes into it. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. It's always like the end result 
that people yeah. kind of fixate on versus that end result. There was a journey. <laughs> there was exactly. A journey to get in there, and it wasn't always pretty. Exactly. Um, and the more you can be, I think in some ways you can never fully be prepared for the ugly side. But if yeah. you accept that there will be an ugly side, at least when it happens, <laughs> exactly. then you're like, okay, I can work through it because I was ready for something to happen. Yeah, exactly. Like when I first moved to LA and people would be like, oh, I, I had this one guy say, oh, I just bought the rest to the Biggie movie. Now, I, I don't know if he had anything to do with the actual Biggie movie that came out, but I remember meeting him and he was like, oh, I have the rest to the Biggie movie. And you know what? I'm going to, if you're cool, I'm going to put you in charge of hair. And I, I remember being 26 years old, like, oh my God, I'm going to be working on the Biggie movie. <laughs> now, needless to say, none of that happened. But, you know what I'm saying? I was just gullible. And I think if I would have had somebody to say, all right, babe, this is what's really going to happen. And let's take everything with a grain of salt. <laughs> Always go forward. Never let people change you. That's my one big piece of advice is mm -hmm. that the industry can wear you down to the point sometimes that you become bitter. You become, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, but what I always tell people is you never let people change who you are. You stay, you stay consistent and the real people will see that and will always, that's, if I was to say anything that gave me the longevity that I have in this business is being consistent to who I was. Mm -hmm. And what it does is also weed out the people that don't yeah. be good for you. You know what I'm saying? When you're consistently a good person and you mean to do people right, People that are trying to do you wrong see that and they steer clear because they're looking for people to help further what they're trying to do. And when they see you don't have any part in that, then they stick away from you. They go away from you. And then God sort of puts in the people that really mean well for you. Like, yeah. I feel like Whoopi, God gave me Whoopi Goldberg. One, because I'm an old soul. So I call Whoopi in her chill days where she don't drink, she don't smoke. So I don't have to worry about that. Like, I, I don't drink out of smoke, so I don't have to worry about being around a client that's like, yeah, let's turn up. Like, yeah. you don't have that problem because she ain't trying to turn up. <laughs> you know, I'm a person that loves being around people that have, like, been world changes to the world. And she's the type of person that those are the, those are the people that is in her zeitgeist. Or like, the people that are like, you know, I, I'll never forget being at her house one time. At her house. So I just remember being at her house one time and I'm doing her hair and her assistant called and says, uh, Whoopi, uh, President Clinton's on the phone. <laughs> I'm like, President Clinton just calling you? And you know what he wanted to say? That he was watching Sister Act and he thought about her. Aww. So I'm just like, where in life does that happen? So... <laughs> God gives you the people that you need in your life. Because that's something only I appreciate, I guess. You know, I don't know if anybody else appreciates it. But I'm like, that's crazy to me. You know? It's crazy. That is crazy. And um and you're you're right. The more you like I said, the more you are yourself, the more you attract likeness. You attract people. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, kind of like the, the people that need to be there, basically. Yep. Um and I think that's a really important lesson for everybody to learn, regardless of what field they're in. It's really important to, like I say, stay true to who you are. You will attract the people that are meant to be there will come and they will stay. You know, they'll stay along for the ride, no matter how wild it may seem. <laughs> One hundred percent. <laughs> and if you could boil it down to one lesson, what do you think is the most important one that you've learned throughout your career? Um, oh my god I don't know if it's what less this <laughs> alright I'm gonna try to okay, I'm gonna, you give me these broad questions okay what less this okay I'm gonna just go on and tell you it's not gonna be one but I'll say this I'll say it very condensed to be yourself carve your own lane keep going forward and don't pay attention to the people beside you like be very comfortable in what you bring, who you are, and you're not trying to compete. It's not a competition. 
you know, so many times we look at what other people are doing and we say, oh my God, well, if they're doing that, why aren't I doing it? And blah, blah, blah. That's not it. If you have your very own things, just be happy with where God is moving you, where he's placing you. Believe in yourself and keep mm-hmm. going. There are going to be some things that's going to make you say, oh, I should quit. But that's all right. I'm just going to keep going. And you just you keep the faith and just, just keep going forward. So I hope yeah. I put that together. <laughs> I hope I put that together. <laughs> but yeah. yeah no, you, you, you did. And it's, um, I think in a world, especially a world where the internet is kind of the center of many things and social media yes. is the center of many things, it's very easy to get into the habit of comparison. And yep. everybody, to some degree, falls victim of that. And as they say, comparison yep. is a thief of joy. <laughs> yeah, and and you have to you have to speak it out loud. I'm a very uh, I, I I truly believe in speaking to yourself and and mm-hmm. speaking it out loud because words have power. And so yes. I'm one of those people that I'm like, you know what? And taking the time to like block everything out and sit there and have those conversations with yourself. I am enough. Um, and I know it sounds very cliche and very, you know, crazy. But these are things you do need to I am enough. What I bring to the table is just as amazing as anybody else. I don't have to do what others do. Like, these are things you really need to tell yourself because you will. You'll be, all it takes is one scroll. And if somebody mm-hmm. you, 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 that does the same thing you do, they just started working with. X, Y, and Z. It's like, oh, but why they didn't call me? I do hair. I know them. Mm-hmm. Why? Did, blah, 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 blah. And it becomes this whole spiral of, well, why am I getting enough? Well, why don't I do that? Blah, blah, blah. And you can't. Everybody's journey is not the same, and we won't all do the same thing. And it's okay. And it doesn't make anybody greater. It doesn't make it's all right. You know what I'm saying? If you are a salon stylist, be the best salon stop. Like, it doesn't make anyone great because you work with celebrities. Because to be honest, it's more of a headache. You're better off with <laughs> with some people at a salon. I just can't do it because my back hurt. But I, I need one person and hit it and quit it. But, you know, I love my clients in the salon. And I love working with, you know, different people, being their ear and all those things. So it's never, yeah. Just be happy, content with what your journey is. So Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think it's also important to remember that everybody has their time. Everybody yep. has the, you know, there's always that thing that takes somebody to the next stage or the stage that they've been really eager to get to. And that will happen at different times for different people. So just because someone's having their, like, their big moment doesn't mean that, you know, your moment won't come. It just means that they're yep. going through this right now. And can I add to that, though? Yeah. Also be prepared that everybody has their moment and there are times that your moment is done. Mm-hmm. And and appreciate that. I think what happens for a lot of us, especially if I'm, I'm 46 years old, 46 years old. I am not the hot new kid on the block, right? Mm-hmm. There comes a time that you have to realize, like, oh, someone else has entered the chat. And let them have their <laughs> moment. Let them have their moment. There are so many. Uh, you, you'd be surprised. It's that fear like, oh, my God, am I still relevant? Am I still relevant? Guess what? Let the new one. I, listen, I am not the biggest weird person. I'm not. I am not that, like, glue you down and all. It's not my thing. I have accepted. That is. Now, I can do it, but I'm not. It's not. I'm not. I'm not doing the Cardi B's. I'm not. Those are not my clients. And I and I receive that. You know what I'm saying? And it's okay. It's okay. So I think just as important as it is on the rise, it's also to be appreciative of what you added to the business and step aside and let other people have it instead of trying to stronghold the space. Like let new people come in and, you know, just do you. No, I... I love that advice because that's something that nobody talks about. Nobody yeah. talks about the moment that you've been up here and now actually you're coming back down. Because it's coming for all of us and no one wants to admit <laughs> it. I, we always talk about the, the, 
just sometimes should even start. And and sometimes it doesn't even mean that you're stepping down. It just means you're stepping to the side. It doesn't mean yeah. that you you're lowering. You know what I'm saying? Because if you contribute it, you will always be legendary in the business, and people will always. You know, there is a uh, what's his Oscar James. Oscar James is a hairstylist that started out way before me. Oscar James, even to this day, is still working in the business and is an amazing hairstylist to this day that has, done, like, he's the person that was doing perm boxes. Then don't nobody even get relaxes no more. But now he was doing Halle Berry. He was doing, he's done them all. But he, and then even to the point what was amazing was even at an older age, he was the person that took over Nicki Minaj and took her from when she was doing more of the, the more character stuff to more of a natural flow. And he did her for a long time. And here he was, an older gentleman. He wasn't that new kid on the block, but he still was relevant. So I think your talent will speak to it for yourself. You don't have to fight to stay in the race. Just, again, if you just stay on your course, you're going to stay. But you you should be okay to let other people come over, come over. Yeah, absolutely. And it's important for the evolution of the industry, right? In order for the industry itself to get better, new people have to come in. And it's obviously yep. probably been inspired by the people that came before them. Yep. Um, but the, the fact is for it to evolve, for it to change, for it to get better, for circumstances to get better, for people to be paid more, for people to be respected more, you have to kind of let the new ones come up. They're also sometimes the ones that make the most noise about those things, right? Yep. Um, and it's really important to give them that space to be like, okay, yeah, you come through and I can see that you're going to kind of kick open doors for so many other people behind you as well. Yep. I agree. And, and I mean, even if that's in a salon, I think you should, if you have a new stylist coming in that salon, help them out. Be, you know what I'm saying? Don't be mad. Don't be feeling like they're going to take your clients. And even if they do, then that means you need to step up your game. So yeah. they can only take what you're, you're allowing. That means they're offering something that you're not offering. And if you get so stuck in your ways that you don't want to change with the times, then you do get left behind. So it's one or the other. You know what I'm saying? You can stay relevant. But that means you have to stay on your game, stay educated to what's going on now, and whatever. But if you're not going to do it, then be okay with the fact that someone else will. So. Yeah, uh, no, 100%. And it's just, I think it's also really important to see that there's enough for everyone. It doesn't have to be a fight. Mm -hmm. There are enough people to serve. There is enough money in this industry. There are enough opportunities for everyone to win. So it doesn't yep. have to feel like it's a fight between yep. anybody. It doesn't have to feel like that. Nope. <laughs> but they would they would like for us to believe that though. They would love yeah. for us to believe that. No, but yeah, it doesn't have to be. We've we've interviewed who have said that sometimes they'll step into scenarios where it's like it feels like they're being pitted against mm. another stylist and it's like I don't like this vibe. I don't like the fact that you're making the two of us fight for this one spot when actually you already probably already know who you want to hire. So why are you bringing both of us into the situation in the first place? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's always been so crazy to me. I've really appreciated all everything that you shared, Derek. An hour has gone by very quickly. <laughs> it has. I, I, you know what? When I do this, I'm like, was I talking too much? I hope I was praying. No, you know what I say? My no. friends hate me. My friends say I tell stories horribly. So I hope, <laughs> I hope I know the story and people was able to keep up. But yeah. No, I, I could keep up. I'm sure everybody okay. that's listening could up and I really appreciated everything that you shared and um the last question I have is you know given given you already do so much I can imagine that there are many moving parts <laughs> happening mm -hmm. at the moment but it would be great to know you know what's next for you what are some of the things that you're working on or have been working on uh so on Tuesday election night which um Glad, I guess, in some way, I leave to go to Paris. Uh, I work with Gloria. I work with Gloria Professional for quite some time now, well, well four years. Um, and so I started as their um, 
I was part of their code co dev or co development for their curls uh, expression line, and now I'm working with them on their blow dryer that they have, which I do pretty much love. And I'm not just saying that, but they have a blow dryer, and I will put it's 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 a blow dryer that basically evaporates the water off the hair instead of using convection heat to blow the hair. And you can definitely tell that the difference, especially on black hair, when you're trying to blow it straight, the cuticle is not blown out in the same way. So it uses um, uh, uh, red therapy light, red light. Um, it's not UV, but it's a, uh, oh my God. Here I am, the spokesperson boy, and can't remember, but because I'm sitting here on the spot. But anyway. <laughs> Anyway, the point is it uses the light to basically dry the hair. Um, so anyway, but they also have a competition that they do every year called the Style and Color Trophy. So I leave, to Par leave for Paris this week to go be a part of that. Um, they normally release it on YouTube around uh, early December. And it's really a great competition. If you're a person that likes uh, any of the hair shows that Bravo used to do back in the day or any type. They actually have one on from last year. People haven't watched it um, where I was the judge on that. And it's really cool because I always admired those shows. So to be a judge on something like that where I get to like, and I, I don't, you know, I'm also like a Tim Gunn because they assign a certain people that we sort of have to like help coach along and like sort of question them yeah. like, Mm, you sure you want to go this route? So they have these things that they do every year. So it's like, you know, it's really dope. And to see the artistry, and it's not just like people from a certain, but it's people from all over the world, from China, Egypt, all mm. over, you know, Brazil, these different hairstyles. So it's beautiful also to see how everyone connects as far as hair and creativity goes. So that's what I'm working on. Steadily pushing forward behind the scenes beauty. Last year I did the first, um, my first brunch. It was more of an anniversary brunch, but um, I'm feeling like I'm going to try to make it a yearly event. But um, it was a brunch to celebrate, you know, my own wins. And um, so I'm trying to get that going um, because this year with the Met Gala, I, my very first episode was a recap of the Met Gala. And I did that. Right. Um, with a whole team of people that had worked in the Met Gala of all black people, which had never, I've never seen. I had never seen black people that weren't just people that they were just giving opinion, people that had worked in the trenches so they could tell you, oh, it takes six months for us to discuss this and blah, blah, blah. So with the, this year being all black males for the theme, the black dandy, um, yeah. I think it would be dope to do the show again this year in some form. So, that's definitely something that I'm trying to work on as well, if nothing else but the brunch, but hopefully to actually put out some material where we discuss. Um, so, yeah, so those are just some of the things uh, I'm trying to get going forward. So hopefully people will follow, watch, and all of this stuff. No, I mean, what we'll do for everybody who's listening, we will also link Derek's social so you'll be able to find him and follow him and keep up to date with all of the things that have just been mentioned. So don't worry, you won't miss out. Um, but that all sounds <laughs> like an amazing lineup of things that are coming up, and I'm super excited to see them. Yes. So, yeah. Um, and then Whoopi's also doing Annie here at Madison Square Garden. So, I've had to make her wig for that and stuff. So, that's been wow. so that starts in uh, December. So, working with her on that. I wasn't intentionally supposed to be doing it, but I'm doing it now, I guess. So, we'll see. <laughs> A busy way to end the year. <laughs> in December. Who are you telling? Who are you telling? But yeah. But I'm I'm uh, grateful for the work and I'm grateful for the opportunities. So yeah. I mean it's like I said, Derek, you've done you've done so much and I think one of the things that I love about interviewing people is being able to say uh, thank you because the position that people are in the you know the people that are coming through like you said you you were inspired by certain people there are many people that are inspired by you um no, and it's genuinely you. been a pleasure to be able to interview you and have you on and learn more about your story because i just feel like the more people learn the more they can be prepared 
and the more they yeah. can be inspired and be like, oh, it's hard, but it's worth it in the end, you know? So sure. thank you for spending this hour with us and sharing so much. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you again. Thank you for having me. No, no, that's fine. And for everybody who is listening, thank you for making it to the end of the hour. <laughs> so I know I want you out. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're super grateful to everybody who listened from beginning to end. Like I mentioned, anything that Derek has mentioned that's like a core brand, somebody to that you should actually be keeping an eye on, there will be links in the newsletter version. So do not worry. You don't have to like be struggling on Google to find everything that we've been talking about. It will be there. Um, so yeah, so take a look at the newsletter for the links. Um, if you've loved listening to this, please share it with other people that you feel could benefit, whether there's aspiring stylists that you know, other people in the textured hair community. The more people that listen, the more people we can help. And that's what we're here for. Um, so again, another big thank you to Derek for being here. Huge thank Thanks. you to everyone who's listening. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.